Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Baltimore County Fire Department EMS Academy. Uh, for those who I haven't met, my name is Sean Barinholtz. I am an anesthesia and ICU physician at Johns Hopkins. I'm an active member of Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company, and I have the honor of serving as one of the associate medical director in Dr. Pollock's office. On behalf of Dr. Pollock and the medical director's office, on behalf of um, the EMS office, Director Shenning, Captain Stewart, Captain Nats, thank you for what you guys do. Thank you for your dedication to lifelong learning. Uh, a big shout out to Ashley Brooks, a young member of Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company who's with us tonight. Uh, he is helping us with the platform. She is also available if you have any difficulties, you can reach her in the chat. She is also the one who is gonna send out a link sometime during this presentation. That link will bring you to a short form if you want your CEU. If you want your CEUs, keep an eye out for the chat. We'll also announce it. Uh, click on that link, enter information. It'll only take a minute or two and we can get you some CEUs for men uh, for this. Um, Actually, also, a big shout out to Lieutenant best. Amanda Wendt for Baltimore County Fire Department. Amanda is the one uh, incredibly oh, dedicated who brought us our speaker tonight, Stephanie Thornton. Uh, Stephanie, for the past 25, 20 years, Stephanie is focusing on assessing and treating different forms of trauma. Stephanie is a licensed independent clinical social worker, master addiction counselor, certified trauma treatment professional. Um, and is trained in eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy. Stephanie is employed as criminal justice specialist by Public Defender Services in West Virginia, where she conducts various trainings for legal professionals, including training on trauma, vicarious trauma, and moral injury, and sits on various boards concerned with the well being of underrepresented individuals. Stephanie, thank you so much for your dedication, for what you do. Thank you for bringing this content and for uh, partnering with us tonight to share your wisdom. Thanks so much. Thank you, and thank you guys for having me. I know that um, in West Virginia, we have a very rural population, obviously, but you know, I don't know how things are for you guys. We've had a 50% increase over um, March of last year till now in EMS calls during COVID from compared to this time last year. And it's, it's just so much going on. And I know you guys have a lot going on. So I appreciate you making the time to be here. Um, we talked about what a proper format was going to be for this evening. So we're going to go through and just kind of power through. It should be about an hour and a half, but there is time and room for questions. And I hope you all will certainly ask questions and interrupt me. If um, you have a question, I'm not monitoring the chat, but I would like for you to, um, if it's a burning question, put an asterisk beside or in front of your question and someone else will do the voice of God and interrupt me and say, hey, we've got a really burning question. Otherwise, um, certainly go ahead and interrupt me. Again, I don't mind. And at the end of this, I'm gonna put the PDF of this presentation into the chat. It'll be a file and you can download that. So if I forget to do that, someone prompt me to do it. But let's go ahead and get started. This is gonna be hopefully something that we all can use right now and you can kind of mull it over and meditate on this as the days and weeks come. So let me get you ready. Okay. So this is kind of a fraught subject, right? Because none of us want to think that we have picked up anything unintentional or unexpected as a consequence of doing our job because we're in these jobs because we love them and you guys are in these jobs because you're saving lives you're really making a difference day in and day out but there can be these secondary consequences to the work that we do and so that's what we're going to talk about I know that many of you know what this building is. It's the Baltimore um, Electric and Gas Building. And I saw it in the national news right before Christmas when the explosion was reported. And this may have affected you all directly. It may have affected many of your brothers and sisters, but it was, you know, it was right before Christmas and it's really tragic. And even seeing this picture may bring up something for you, but this is the work that you do. You know, you go in and you rescue the people that were the window washers hanging on the side of the building. You go into the face of danger. And that's what's so interesting to me because when 
we're growing up, we're taught not to run to the fire. We're taught not to run into danger. But because of your jobs, you're taught to do just that very thing. You're telling your body and your system to override that message that you got to stay safe growing up and to instead run to the fire, run to the danger. And you're strategically doing it, but you're still doing it. And so that came can bring on a lot of stress. And you're gonna hear me talk interchangeably about stress and trauma. And I'm, you know, I'm not real good about having any kind of in between with that. Stress can be trauma. Trauma can be stress. It doesn't mean that you have post-traumatic stress disorder, but it does mean that there is a recurring stress and strain that happens on you and it can take a toll. I remember I was doing some work with some National Guards members. They had come to West Virginia for the um, National Boy Scout Summit. It was a Boy Scout Jamboree. And so we had National Guard members from all over the world. And I was trying to engage them on stress work and trying to talk to them about how to de-stress and debrief and decompress at the end of the day. And I was talking to a group of soldiers from Croatia. And I said, do you have any stress? Do you have any? Um, additional worries in your job and they said oh we don't have any stress and I thought you're soldiers right you have to have some kind of stress you're seeing really tough things but they didn't label it that way and that's fine I don't care how any of us label this stuff it's the idea of how it impacts us and so we're going to talk a little bit about what the different kinds of stress are and how they impact us one of the first ones that we're gonna talk about is in this cartoon. And it says the little engine that had a husband, kids and a full-time job and did everyone's emotional labor all of the time. And I've got cartoons strung through this, but this is one example of stress that happens. We have stress in our day-to-day -day lives, right? We have stress of managing our families and managing our jobs and talking to neighbors or friends or trying to take care of family members from afar and we're, we're trying to juggle all those balls all at once. And so that's one form of stress. And that form of stress is not necessarily a bad form of stress. You know, it's something that we can manage. And stress can actually be good. Stress can be manageable and it can help us sharpen our attention. You know, it can help us prepare for threatening situations. It can help us prepare to do our job. If you think about going in to ask your boss for a raise or ask your boss for additional resources to do your job, you're going to have a certain degree of stress that you build up so that you can do that. So you can get over that hurdle and talk to your boss about what you need. And that comes from our brain being able to regulate when we need more energy, when we need more attention, when we need more ability to look for something that might be risky, like our boss telling us no, something that might be dangerous, like the jobs that you all do, or something that causes us to prepare for fight or flight when we're really under threat. And that's our brain preparing us for stress. And repeated stress exposure is when you're constantly having different levels and forms of stress. And so if you're having regular stress over time, then the brain starts to look for stress all the time. It starts to think that there's stress everywhere that you are and it never really decompresses. It never really comes back to normal. And those repeated stress events can cause stress reactions. And those stress reactions are most prone in first responders and emergency medical personnel. So our brain determines when to come back to normal. It determines when to react and respond to something in the environment. And it gets the body ready to, to react. What it does is it looks at a situation and it tries to figure out, have we been here before? Is this something that we've seen before? Because if we've been here before, I don't need to respond as vigorously as if I've never seen this dangerous situation before. So if, if it says, yeah, we've been here before, we knew how to deal with it, we know how to cope, then it doesn't respond as vigorously. But if there's doubt, if it's a new stress, if it's something scary and threatening, then it's going to kick everything into high gear. It's going to cause everything to be on high alert so it can respond to that stress event because it doesn't know how things are going to work out. And so what it does is it looks for that danger or stress event. And once it sees it, it starts to interpret that information and it tells the adrenal glands, hey, we got to get going. 
and the adrenal glands start to release adrenaline and other endorphins and that tells us that we are ready to either fight or fly and that looks like having an increased heart rate our muscles tensing having shortened breath or short breaths extra blood to the organs and muscles so we can get ready to run or fight having oxygen increased to the brain so that we can have more hyper alertness and awareness and also having those endorphins released so that we have those natural painkillers. And you think about people that have been in a horrible car accident and then they walk away from it. Those are those endorphins kicking in because they were in that stressful situation and maybe their muscles tensed. They had more alertness from the oxygen being released to the brain. And then they had those natural painkillers released, which allowed them to walk away. They may not have been okay later on, but in that moment, they were able to walk away and survive. That's the brain on stress. But what happens after all of that process, right? You're ready to fight or fly, but you also have to de-stress or decompress. And that's where we have recovery time built in. And that's really a necessary part of the typical stress reaction cycle. And I've got a picture here of Usain Bolt because he does a lot of those things in his races. If you've ever seen him or any other Olympic sprinter get ready for a race and he's the fastest man in the world. So he's good at this, right? He's good at being ready to to fly, to run. And so he gets down in the blocks and you'll see him start to exhale very quickly. So he's telling his brain, hey, we're gonna run, we're gonna fly. He's ready for fight or flight. And then when the gun goes off and starts to run, he doesn't stop as soon as he crosses the finish line. Any Olympic runner is going to keep moving and they're gonna slow down gradually and they're gonna take some laps around the track. And that's their recovery time. They need to give their brain time to get back into balance, to be restored. There are a lot of chemical reactions that we just saw that happen when we're responding to stress, when we're responding to fight or flight. But you also have to give your body and brain time to get back to equilibrium. We get that too from animals. I've got a picture here of zebras and zebras in the Serengeti, if they're being chased by lions, if the lion doesn't get them, they don't just stop and stand still and say, okay, it's over with. What happens is they continue to run. They continue to kind of run it off and canter and gradually will slow down because if they stopped suddenly after that chase, then they could die. All of that chemical reaction is so profound that it impacts and overwhelms their system. So they literally have to run it off. So what happens if you don't have recovery time built in? If you constantly have stress building up and etching away and compounding one on the other on the other? Well, if you lose that recovery time and just constantly and chronically have stress, then you're going to constantly be looking for danger. Everything's going to be looking like a dangerous place. You're going to start to have negative emotions like depression and anxiety. Your judgment's going to be impaired. You're going to question yourself. You're going to have sleep disturbances, maybe have fitful sleep, get up in the middle of the night, not be able to go to sleep, and then having changes in your eating, drinking, and drug use habits. Because when problems arise with stress and we can't turn it off or we don't turn it off and we don't have that recovery time, then these are the consequences. Your brain and your body thinks everything's dangerous. And some of those long-term effects look like if you were going to rev a car engine for days or weeks at a time. And that happens inside your body because you constantly have this chemical reaction going on. That long-term activation of the stress response system does have an impact on heart problems. You hear about people having heart attacks that can be related to long-term chronic stress, stomach problems, GI problems, inflammation, having sleep disturbances, headaches, anxiety, being on edge, and just generally being tired, just tired to your soul. All of those can be long-term effects of chronic stress. When we're looking at stress in the environment, our brains are hardwired to look for the negative. And that's something that we get from our ancestors. That's something that we had to learn from them to survive. Our ancestors, when they were coming into this world, they had to learn three things, how to attach, approach, or attack. And the brain started looking for things that could kill them. 
because if they were going into the bushes to go get food, to approach food, they had to be alert and aware of if there was a tiger in the bushes. So they were constantly aware of that negative. If there was a tiger in the bushes and they prepared to attack, then they would live to see another day. And if they could live to see another day, then they could approach food in the future and they could attach to a mate. If they went to the bushes and didn't expect to see a tiger, then they could be killed and they wouldn't pass on the genes that we have since developed. So when we are picking up on negative events, when we're picking up on negative stories, when we're perceiving danger in situations all around us, it's because our brains are hardwired to look for that negativity. It's a survival mechanism. And over time, we have pretty successfully learned that not everything is dangerous. Not everything is a tiger in the woods. So we've been able to turn that responsiveness to negativity down a little bit. But that every time that we encounter stress, every time we see something that's dangerous or threatening or something that really gives us pause to make us realize that we're in a risky situation for survival, then we're heightening that stress response and our brains are turning back into looking for the negative. So I like this image because it reminds me of how the brain is and it also reminds me of how we can be with the brain on stress. And so if you take your fist and if you take your finger, your finger is the limbic system. That's the reptilian part of the brain that we have inherited from our ancestors. And this limbic system typically gets tucked underneath your fingers. And the fingers are the prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex is what keeps you safe. It's what you learned growing up not to run into traffic, to make good decisions, to follow through on your responsibilities, to make good choices, to prioritize and stay under control. So typically, our brains are responding by keeping the prefrontal cortex on top, keeping us safe, keeping our judgment intact, and keeping the limbic system in check. So I just said that, you know, we have been able to kind of tamp down some of that seeking out negativity from our ancestors. And that's because our prefrontal cortex is covering up our limbic system. But what happens is when we see a dangerous environment, when we see things in our environment that cause us to fear for our own survival, then that limbic system, it starts to heighten. It starts to take over. It starts to take control. And it disrupts the prefrontal cortex, which is the front part of the brain that's keeping us safe, right? Because the brain starts to think, you know, it, we're not safe anymore. So what exactly is the prefrontal cortex doing? I need to be ready for fight, flight, or freeze. And so it taps into the defense circuitry, that limbic system, that reptilian part of the brain. And if we're ready to fight, flight, or freeze, then we're thinking back to approach, attach, and attack. And so we're going back to how our ancestors' brains operated because that limbic system is on full force. So what does that look like? If you're talking to someone else or if someone else is talking to you and you've got that limbic system in full force, what's it look like? Well, the amygdala, which is part of the limbic system, it's the part of the brain, it's like the size of a, or it looks the shape of, not size of, shape of an almond, it starts to have increased density. And that's where trauma and substance use memories are stored. And what that means is it looks like you're on edge. You've got a comeback to say, you are looking for the negative in the world all the time, and you're constantly on guard. Maybe you're, you're jumping, maybe you're looking around the corner, maybe you're constantly looking at danger. Your left hippocampus, which is also part of that limbic system and is responsible for mood regulation, well, it increases and you're moody, you're on edge, you're ready for a quick comeback, and you're snappy with people. When that prefrontal cortex is disconnected, it means that you're going to be more spontaneous. You're not going to follow through on things. You're not going to think about what's going to cause you harm. You're just going to act or react. And if your default mode network, which we didn't talk about, but it's another part of the brain that works together to help you follow through on tasks and helps you remember what to do next. Well, if that goes offline because of trauma or stress reactions, then it causes you to be more forgetful. You might 
forget to do things altogether. You might jump from one task to another without completing anything. Your mind starts to wander. You start to daydream. You start to second guess yourself. And here's the worst part. You start to criticize yourself. You start to turn that outside attack in the world back onto yourself. Long-term stress also has an effect on the brain by decreasing gray matter. And we have gray matter in a variety of places in the brain, but in the temporal parietal junction, what happens when you've got decreased gray matter is you have self-doubt, second guessing, you're not sure, you've got a low self-esteem, and you constantly are beating yourself up. So if you find that you're experiencing any of these things, you wanna wonder, has this stress gotten to me? Has this work gotten to me? If people are saying you're moody, you're on edge, you're forgetful, you're hypervigilant, you're constantly jumpy, you constantly are beating yourself up for something, then you might want to consider if this is having an effect. When we have this negative perception or the self-criticism, then our brain doesn't recognize whether it's coming from the outside or coming from the inside. And so it triggers that limbic system and our limbic system simply reacts, it simply responds. And it becomes this cycle of constantly telling yourself you're in danger and constantly thinking like you're not doing enough to stay safe from the danger. And so the threats that you see in the environment start to turn to threats against yourself and you believe everything's ruined, everything's bad, I'm so stupid, I should have done this differently. And so your brain's under attack from yourself. And since your brain doesn't distinguish between being under attack by yourself or being under attack by something outside of yourself, it's reacting in the same way. It's still having that same response system where it's triggering the adrenal glands. It's releasing endorphins and adrenaline. It's preparing you for fight or flight. It's increasing your heart rate. It's increasing oxygen to your brain. It's increasing the release of cortisol, which is a stress hormone. And it constantly does that, whether you're seeing it outside of yourself or you're telling it to yourself. So this is a clip from Saturday Night Live when Chris Farley was with us. And I always think about this when I think about negative self-talk, when I think about beating ourselves up, because he did a wonderful job with this episode. It's just a couple seconds. Hopefully. As it's loading, he's asking uh, Jeff Daniels about his movie, Purple Rose of Cairo, and that's where this picks up. Uh, remember when you were doing your movie and uh, <laughs> Mia Farrow was watching and then you came down off the screen and talked to her and you were in black and white when you were on the screen, but then when you talked to her, you were in color. Yeah, what about it? Um, you remember that? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that won some awards, didn't it? Uh, no, not really. Oh, God damn it, what an idiot. <laughs> I'm sorry. So that's Chris Farley beating himself up for something that's not that bad, right? But he's putting himself under attack. And that's what we do a lot of times, too. When we are going through the process of our day and maybe looking back on what we did and how we did, when something goes wrong, do you think, that's okay, I'll be able to rebound from that? Or do you think, oh God, I'm so stupid, I ruined everything. We naturally have a tendency to go to the negative because of our ancestors. So if we're going to the negative, then we're putting ourselves under attack. Also, if you think at the end of the day as you're reviewing everything, if you consider if someone said three positive things to you, four neutral things and two negative things, what do you remember? What do you think about and have go over in your head over and over again? I don't know about you, but I think about the negative. Doesn't matter how many positives, I go over that negative at the end of the day. That's what sticks to me. And that's how self-judgment happens. You know, we start feeling like we're no good, like we're not making a difference, like we're never good enough. And that's what this cartoon says. It's always good dog, never great dog. We start to compare. Mm -hmm. We start to compare ourselves to other people and other things. We look at Instagram feeds. We look at tw uh, Twitter. We look at Facebook. We look at our neighbors, and we think, God, 
why don't we have that? We look at our coworkers and think they're so happy. You know, why can't I be happy? Why can't I have something better? And so we start to feel like nothing's ever good enough and we're not good enough either. Hang on a second, guys, there we go. So that threat defense system coupled with those feelings of never good enough can really come to culmination with doom scrolling. Have you guys heard of doom scrolling? was the word of the day in, in December. And it basically means going through a news feed and looking for anything negative. And I don't know if anyone else does this, but it's pretty easy to do. You know, if you look at a, a news feed, your brain may naturally be drawn to the bad stuff in the news. And it feels like there's a lot of bad stuff in the news nowadays. So it's reinforcing our threat defense system, and that's reinforcing our feelings that we're not good enough and the world's a dangerous, bad place. So in this cartoon, it says, my desire to be well-informed is currently at odds with my desire to remain sane. And that's how it feels going through the news, certainly, is do we need to be well-informed or do we need to take care of ourselves? And what's interesting is there is a way to measure how we as a society are feeling based on the news and the events in our life. And I know this is a really tough graphic to see, but it's something called the hedonometer. And it is a thing, it's a database um, out of University of Vermont. And what happened is in 2008, these researchers said, wonder how we can measure happiness in society. Wonder if we can see if people are happy. And about that time, Twitter had come online and Twitter had four employees. And so these researchers at the University of Vermont contacted Twitter and said, hey, can we have all your English speaking tweets? And they said, yeah, sure, no problem. And these researchers were able to categorize certain words in tweets to see if they were happy words or if they were sad or depressed words. And that's what this shows. This graphic is showing you all the different tweets that happened at different times from 2008 until 2021. And you see several spikes in here. And I'm going to get to some other slides that kind of show that a little bit more closely. Here you have blue arrows that highlight Christmas Day in uh, 2009 and again in 2020. Christmas Day became the standard for when people sent out the happiest tweets. And again, these are all English speaking tweets. So you've got other things that are making people happy, like Mother's Day or Thanksgiving, or there was a big spike when BTS had a birthday. So different things make people happy. And so they were measuring these things. But as they continued to measure them, they saw these big drops in happiness also. And here's a close up and you can see how low we are with the left arrow to another low point with a right arrow. And the left arrow is 2017, the right arrow is 2020. And you've got this high spike in Christmas day all the way down to this low spike from January 6th last week. And what they have found is since 2015, we have lost as an English speaking society, an entire Christmas day worth of joy. We have gone from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows, but on average, we've lost a Christmas day of joy. And we're looking at the negative and we're taking on the negative. It's not just what's happening in our lives, it's also what we're seeing in our environment, in the news, what we're hearing on television, what we're reading on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. All of these things are compounding and causing us to feel and respond with stress reactions. So this says it's 2021, but I'm still writing year long fever dream of chaos and despair on my checks. And that's how a lot of people feel is, yeah, you know, we turned a page on the calendar, but it doesn't feel any better. You know, we're still having record overdoses and record evictions and having to suit up and gear up just to go respond to someone. You all now have so many layers of PPE that you have to put on just to go make your calls. That's stress in and of itself. So that's still happening, even though we're back to a different year, it didn't change anything. So I wanna encourage you, like I said, if you're seeing some things that may apply to you, maybe explore that some of the work could be getting to you. 
you know, that there are some unexpected consequences from your work. And I don't say that because I think that you can't do the job. I've explored this myself and it's not that I can't do the job. It's that sometimes we pick up stuff when we don't think we are. Sometimes our work has unexpected consequences and we have to figure out, is it having an impact? And if so, how is it impacting us? So that's what we're gonna talk about next. So I have this up here because my husband is a college professor and this is what he says to me. I'm not stressed. Gets up at three in the morning before his classes, doesn't sleep well. He goes over things in his head over and over and over again, what he needs to do and how he needs to prepare. And he plays out the different scenarios before he gets to class. And so his classes don't start until 2.30 in the afternoon. I should qualify that. So when he's getting up at three to prepare for his class, I say that that's stress. That's just one way of stress being exhibited. And this is another example of someone that doesn't want to call it stress. I don't care what you call it, but it's having an impact on you. It's, it's causing something to take shape that's not typical, that's not your typical self. And so if you find yourself waking up early, having disturbed sleep, going over things in your head, trying to prepare and over prepare, and then playing out different scenarios, then you may want to consider if that's having an impact on you. First responders and other helpers and volunteers come to tragedies as this heroic person and you are heroic people. You're, you're showing up when no one else does. You're showing up when we need you. And I think that that is amazing and heroic because you're there with open hearts to help. But with open hearts, there's a secondary consequence of picking up all that you see. It doesn't mean that your heart's closed off because you're showing up. It means that your heart's wide open because you're showing up. And so when you see the hurt and the harm and the pain and the trauma and the stress, it's almost impossible to block that out because you care that's what you're picking up. And so when you think about how that impacts you, you start to pick it up in your body. You start to have that in your mind. Maybe you had the memory of something that you saw on the job. Maybe you had the memory of what someone said to you or what you heard. And that can be something we carry with us. And there are symptoms that come from that and there are signs to look for. So let's see what some of those signs are to see if you're picking up some of that work. You can have behavioral changes. And we talked a little bit about that with stress. You know, increase in substance use, being irritable and angry and short-tempered and argumentative and having quick comebacks, not being able to relax, missing work, not feeling like going to work, not feeling like getting out of bed, being reckless and accident prone, having physical problems. We talked about some of that with stress also. You know, GI problems, stomach problems, headaches, dizziness, blurred vision, weight loss or gain, muscle tremors, twitches, chronically being tired and being startled easily, emotional problems, feeling heroic, euphoric, invulnerable. That goes with the, uh, that increased response to get ready for a threat, which is wonderful. But if that bleeds into other areas, then that may be an effect of stress also having anxiety and depression, guilt or shame, or social effects like isolating, blaming others, blaming yourself, having relationship problems, having a difficult time giving support or receiving support, and not being able to have fun, not knowing how to relax and have fun. All of these are common stress effects. And some of the signs to look for is if you're feeling helpless and hopeless. You know, if you think, why am I getting out of bed? I don't make a difference. Why am I even trying? It's not worth the pain and the risk. You don't have the resources anyway. It's not going to help anything. Being hyper vigilant, focused on the job, always ready to go, always looking for danger, eating in a hurry, drinking in a hurry, doing everything in a hurry like you, you just don't have time to do it, and then looking for danger at every turn. Minimizing. Nothing's as bad as what you've seen before. Downplaying anything because it doesn't fit into the most extreme category. Not being able to see how something might impact you 
because you've seen so much that your feelings about what's happened and what's happening and what you're seeing don't come into play. Chronic exhaustion is really tough because you feel like every cell in your body is tired. Everyone that you came from as a person is a tired person and you're just not going to get that energy back. Constantly looking for danger around every turn, constantly being on high alert, and then realizing that there can be some physical ailments that are associated with people in law enforcement and first responders. And that's, you know, having back pain, migraines, body aches, high blood pressure, heart problems, depression, and anxiety. You also might feel guilt, not feeling like you're doing enough or being enough. Maybe having a conflict in how you feel about what you're doing versus how you think you should feel about what you're doing or how you feel about yourself versus how you should feel about yourself. There's also a question about resource allocation. And this is a tough one because if you only have so many resources to give and you can give the resources to a limited number of people, then maybe you feel guilty over, am I making the right choices? Am I saving the right people? Am I giving the right resources to the right people? It's really easy to feel guilty. Having anger and cynicism, thinking things aren't fair, maybe they're not fair. Having difficult choices to make and being angry about that, thinking people aren't going to change. You know, if you go out on a call to revive someone with naltrexone five times in a day, it's got to be aggravating to say the least, right? Or if you go out to respond to someone who is a smoker that's constantly using oxygen, you know what that risk is and it can make you angry and you can be cynical about what do I want to help that person. And then finally, substance use. You know, when you're starting to feel on edge, when your sleep's disrupted, when you can't turn off, when you're constantly looking for danger everywhere you go, when you constantly are beating yourself up and you feel like you're not good enough and you're not as good as the other people and things are getting under your skin, then it might seem natural that drugs or alcohol help you turn that off. And in moderation, it can. But the problem is when you're that raw, when you're that on edge, your brain constantly looks for the drug or the alcohol to repeat the behavior. And so when you're under a great deal of stress, instead of having one drink and turning that off, pretty soon it becomes six drinks because your brain's like, if one's good, six is better. If six are good, two dozen are better because it constantly is looking for a different kind of reward. And so you're not in control of the amount that you consume, you're not in control of turning yourself off because your brain's trying to artificially look for that reward through the substance. And so it's really easy to fall into a substance use problem when you're feeling a lot of stress and strain. So what do you want to be when you give up? I like this because, you know, sometimes when we do feel so challenged with our work, when we feel so challenged on the job, when we have so much stress and strain, it feels like we want to give up. It feels like, what's the point? And in this cartoon, they're starting early, which is sad, but that's how you feel sometimes. It's, you know, I just don't know what to make. I don't know what's in my future, but you have to do your job, right? Even if you have this self-doubt and depression and hopelessness, and you think, well, I'm going to contain it to home or I'm going to contain it to the weekends or I'm going to contain it to the evenings. No one's going to know that I'm second guessing myself. It bleeds out into the work that we do. It does have an impact on the job, even though you've got an open heart and it is a strength of the work that you do. It can also become a weight on the work that you do because that open heart means that you're empathic and you're constantly trying to help people and you only have so much to give. You might be second guessing yourself and that's really risky if you're a first responder. You know, that judgment and that being strategic in the face of running to the fire. If you're second guessing yourself, then that comes up with its own risk. And then also you might not feel like you're doing what you should be doing. You might feel like, you know, I, I maybe need a different job. I need a different kind of employment because this is just not working for me and it's not working at all. And that 
can be a sign as well that there are different kinds of work related and community created stress that fall into categories. So let's see what some of these categories are. Secondary trauma is one of the categories where you think, you know, I'm not directly experiencing the trauma. I'm not directly experiencing the hurt, but you're feeling overwhelmed by what you're seeing. You're taking home what you see. You're dreaming about it. You're not able to turn it off. And it really shifts the way that you see the world. This is where you're seeing so much danger and so much harm that you're seeing danger yourself everywhere you are. There was an example of a child support worker who was so entrenched in child support work that every time she looked at someone else's children, she thought, I can tell you if one of their kids is going to grow up and not pay their child support. That's being entrenched by the trauma that you're seeing, being able to, to see it everywhere you are and not turn it off not keep it confined to what happened to one person, but taking it on yourself, that's secondary trauma. Another category where you might second guess yourself and you might think this work's getting to me and I may need a different kind of job is empathy fatigue. It's also called compassion fatigue, but it's when you're listening to other people's stories. You know, you're not able to bounce back. You don't have that recovery time built in. You're listening to people's hardship over and over and over again. And while this doesn't change your worldview, it does weigh on you. It makes you tired. It makes you hurt. It makes you tend to other people instead of tending to yourself. And so it's, these are some of the symptoms of secondary trauma. And you're going to see they're very similar to some of the symptoms of stress reactions and chronic stress. So grief, anxiety, being distracted irritable and angry, being cynical, generally feeling like the world's a dangerous place and unsafe, increased substance use, changes in your eating patterns, feeling hopeless and lacking purpose. And these are some of the symptoms of empathy fatigue. So I have it as for the listener because you are the listener. You're picking up on other people's stories. You're hearing what other people are saying. Being exhausted, chronically fatigued, having these out-of-body experiences, giving more than being the receiver, being irritable, questioning yourself, hating yourself, weight loss, headaches, not being satisfied on the job. There's another category here and that's burnout. And burnout is similar to someone who's a workaholic, right? So it's an imbalance between work life and personal life. And this is actually going to get its own category in the International Classification of Disease Manual, which is the ICD-11. And that's what doctors use to diagnose you um, as, a, as a workplace condition. So it's gonna get a diagnosis in 2022 as a workplace condition. And it's because it has chronic consequences. So if you're burnt out, you're wanting to do a different job. You're wanting to go work at Starbucks. You just can't imagine going back to your day-to-day -day job because it depletes you. The job causes you exhaustion. You feel like you need to get emotional distance from the, from the job. You're constantly feeling negative about the job or feeling cynical on the job. And it doesn't make you do the job as well. You've got um, recklessness. You've got challenges that you can't overcome, your judgment's off, and you're not as effective on the job. And that's why burnout is a real thing, just like secondary trauma and empathy fatigue. Now, I mentioned that not all trauma is post-traumatic stress disorder, but post-traumatic stress disorder is a thing also. And this is the latest version of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, and it gave post-traumatic stress disorder its own category. So it placed PTSD in stress-related disorders, and it expanded it also, and it expanded it in a way that impacts you all, because it takes into account that secondary trauma, where either you can be personally experiencing and directly experiencing the trauma event, or you can be observing that trauma event. So if you show up on the scene of a trauma event and you feel threatened, if you learn of someone close to you feeling threatened and that their life was threatened, then you can pick up on that and repeated exposure 
to observing a trauma event or experiencing a trauma event can result in PTSD. And they expanded this to include first responders, not just people that are directly at risk of death themselves, but people that are witnessing it. People like yourselves that are going to the scene first out the gate and observing the most tragic and traumatic situations. So you are at risk of getting PTSD. But I will also say that as common as trauma and stress reactions are, PTSD is not as common. You might have talked to some people that have experienced some really horrific things and they seem fine, right? Not everyone that experiences horrific things gets PTSD. In fact, it's about seven or eight million Americans a year that get it. And while that's still a large number, I don't want to minimize that, not everyone that experiences trauma or witnesses trauma gets PTSD. So we have the ability to kind of guard against that and not necessarily have the symptoms of it. But that is something to keep in mind. So if you've gotten to this point and you're not really sure where you fall into all of this, if you're not sure if you have stress reactions, if you're not sure if you have chronic stress, if you're not sure if you have secondary trauma, if you're not ready to you know, hang up your hat and go work at Starbucks, I want you to consider what would other people say about you? Would they say you don't care? That you question yourself and you doubt yourself? That you worry about being correct? and that keeps you from acting, you procrastinate, you feel stuck, you're edgy and argumentative, you're irritable, you snap back. Sometimes we can get a good perspective on ourselves if we consider how other people see us. If I went to your partner, if I went to your kids, if I went to your spouse and said, what are you like? What would they say if they were being honest? That can give you a good idea of whether or not this is having some kind of effect. So maybe the work is getting to you. What are you supposed to do about it? So if the oxygen mask drops down, put your own mask on first and then help the person next to you. And I love this because if you can't take care of yourself, you don't have anything else to give to anyone else. And I said before that you have open hearts and you're heroic. But if you can't put on your own oxygen mask, then you can't keep your heart open and you can't be heroic. You can't save lives. So you have to put that oxygen mask on first and take care of yourself. So in the midst of your stress, in the midst of a high risk situation, when you're responding to a call, when you're in the field, can you use earplugs? If it's safe to limit noise, that can decrease some of your reactivity to a stress response. Make sure that you have fresh, clean clothes to come back to at the end of a call, because sometimes it's really necessary to wash away the emotion of the day and to change into something clean and just have the smell of clean clothes on you. It can change your entire attitude and it can help you deal with that stress. Eat slowly, if possible. Sit down, if possible, to eat. Take breaks. And engage in a group of peers with conversation about what you're dealing with, what you saw. It's not war stories. It's really, hey, that, that was awful. That was bad. That one, that one was tough. And just sharing about what you're witnessing. Because if you bring it up, odds are other people have experienced it also. Ask yourself, am I doing, why am I doing what I'm doing? You got into this work for a reason. And it's really easy when you're under stress and you see so much badness and so much tragedy and so much to just feel overwhelmed by that it makes you wonder if you're doing it for the right reasons. But think back to why you got into this. You know, why did you go through training? Why did you go through all the effort and the energy and the work to get to where you are. What was your goal? And if you remind yourself of that, then you can remember that this is what you have to do. This is what you can live by. You can bear almost anything else 
if you remember why you got into it to begin with. Don't lose sight of that. And it is easy. I realize that. But remind yourself why you did this to begin with. Add in something to your workday that's going to make you happy, that's going to bring you joy, that's going to help you decompress. You know, think about it in the morning before you go to work. What would make you happy? What's the toughest part of your day? What's something that you can add in? Is it music? Is it sitting down to eat? Is it taking a brief break? Is it, you know, doing something mindless in the middle of a really stressful day? Think about it in advance and then put it to action. What can you do to make that happen? If you think about it before you go in during the day, make sure that you're including how you're going to make it happen. If there's someone that can help you do it, ask them first thing. Think about what you'd say to a friend. You know, we do beat ourselves up. We do feel guilty. We think that we're dumb. We think of the things that we did wrong and we remember those wrong things at the end of the day. Those things are bigger to us as we're beating ourselves up and as we're under threat than they are to anyone else. If someone who is a friend came to you and told you the exact same thing that you're feeling bad about, the same thing that you're beating yourself up about, what would you say to them? How would you re respond? You know, you wouldn't think to say to them, well, that was stupid. I don't know why you would have done that. You reassure them. You make them feel better. Turn that back on yourself. Reassure yourself. Be compassionate with yourself. Be kind to yourself. And refocus. If you can refocus through the day, then that's going to help you restore your balance. That's going to help you restore after all the stress and the threats that you're experiencing. And to refocus, you want to encourage cooperation. Get with your peers, get with your coworkers, partner with them, be attentive, but don't beat yourself up. You know, it's easy to fall into that judgmental mode. Let that go. Just be focused. Don't place your blame on yourself and don't place your blame on other people. And you can still be empathic. You can still have an open heart without adopting those feelings as your own, right? So you can still be in the moment without taking that on, without taking that in and letting it get to you. So here's a very basic picture of the brain. And at the front to the left where it says self-criticism, worry, rumination, and guilt, all of those are coming into the brain through the prefrontal cortex and they represent threat. And when those come in, they start to move towards the amygdala and tell the brain, hey, we're under threat. We're under attack. We need to respond. And it's getting ready to get the reptilian part of the brain to react. But if you start to practice some of these techniques, like refocusing or taking perspective, why do you do this work? Well, you do it because you love it, because you're good at it. Taking time for yourself, adding in something that helps you get through the day, that helps you decompress through the day, that brings you joy. And then saying something to a friend that you would say to yourself instead, that helps soothe that threat response system. And that's because there's a part of the brain called the compassionate network. And if we practice compassion with ourselves, then we can trigger that compassionate network and it can decrease the threat response system. So doing these four different things can actually help us decrease our responses to threat. It can decrease our stress reactions and it doesn't make us feel like there's a tiger in the bushes anymore. We can tone that down again and see the world for what it's like. Here are 10 other things that you can do. And these are things that you can do pretty easily. Doesn't cost any money. Getting enough sleep, getting enough to eat, light exercise and your jobs are rigorous, but this could be something as simple as stretching at the end of the day, stretching before you get in bed. Varying the work that you do, you may not have that ability directly, but think about doing something mindless in the middle of the day. You know, you don't always have to be so um, in charge, so reactive. Is there something that you can do that doesn't have as much thought or energy or strategic intent behind it? 
doing something pleasurable. Focusing on what you did well. Think about a time that someone gave you a compliment. Sometime that someone said you did a good job. Sometime that someone said I couldn't have done it without you or you saved my life. How did that make you feel? Focus on that. Learn from your mistakes. And that can be something as simple as it's not worthwhile to beat yourself up. There's no benefit in it. So that's a mistake. Move on. Share a private joke. Pray, meditate, breathe, relax, close your eyes for a moment, whatever works for you to give you a pause and support a colleague. Because you realize that if you're going through it, someone else might. And you can get a lot of compassion for yourself by giving to someone else. So what can you do if you think that you might be experiencing burnout or secondary trauma or compassion fatigue? Well, notice the symptoms. You know, think about what we've talked about here. They're very similar. They are all pretty intertwined. That grief, that anxiety, that guilt, that beating yourself up, depression, fatigue, sleeplessness, going over things at the end of the day, dreaming about work, all of that's pretty intertwined. So if you're having those symptoms, take care of yourself. Start to implement some of the 10 things. Start to be compassionate towards yourself and be kind to yourself. Add in positive things through the day. Recharge, give yourself time to recover. Take breaks during the work day. Eat well if you can. Have relationships outside of work so you have things other than shop to talk about. Maybe you're into meditation or breathing. Maybe you like massage, maybe you like exercise, practicing yoga. These are all things that help restore our brain physiology because it helps increase the gray, gray matter. So when our gray matter is decreased because of all the stress, you want to do things that are going to increase the gray matter so that we're more responsive and less reactive. We're more calm and we put that space between when something happens and how we react. Make sure that if you're having a tough day on the job, create a safe space around you. So that may be telling coworkers and colleagues, yet yeah, today's not the day. I don't want to talk shop. You know, I want to set limits on that. This is tough. And that's okay to say that. You know, it's okay to have a safe space because if you're living it day in and day out, you don't also have to talk about it day in and day out. And that may be helpful for other people too. And know when it's time to get professional help. You know, this is an unprecedented amount of stress that we've all been going through because of COVID. But you all in particular, you're responding to overdose calls, you're responding to emergencies, you're responding to situations that are more violent. You're having to gear up in PPE before you even get out to the call. You know, all of that is increasing your stress response and it is unprecedented. Counselors do have wait lists that they've not imagined that they would have before, but they are there. Therapists are there, peer groups are there, employee assistance programs are there, pastoral counselors are there. Whatever it is that can be of assistance to you, if it's not working, if it's impacting who you are with yourself, with your relationships, with your friends on the job, then it's okay to to get someone outside of your head, outside of the things that you're trying to do to change the consequences, to give you some support. Self-care is really building in that recovery time. It's making sure that you get that equilibrium back from all those chemical reactions that are going on inside of your body to normal so that you can do your job safely and effectively. And it's making sure that you stay in the profession. You got into it for the right reasons. You got into it because you're good at it. You got into it because you love what you do and you're saving lives every day. And we need you, but you've got to take care of yourself too. And that's where the self-care comes in. So what can you use out of this? What do you think that you can put into play? What do you think is going to be useful for you? So I'm going to check the chat and I thought we'd just take a moment to go ahead and see how you all are feeling about this. Do you think this is something that you can put into your day to day?
So I'll certainly start off and just one of many times just to share, thank you so much. What a ton of great information. Yeah, I think for me, it's really been a journey, right? I mean, it's about taking on kind of new habits over time and continually kind of recrafting. The self-compassion literature I have found very helpful. I often am very critical of myself and I uh, have a mantra, may I give myself the same compassion that I would give to others. Yep. And I love that mantra. Thank you for sharing that because when you think about being compassionate, you want to start with yourself. And if you think about different religions around the world, whether it's Christianity or Buddhism or um, Taoism, you are thinking about if you have compassion for other people, you have to start to have compassion for yourself. If you're taking care of other people, you have to take care of yourself. And so that all goes hand in hand. And a mantra is a great place to start. What is something that you can say to yourself every day? What's something that you can put on the mirror? Anyone else think that they could, they could pick up some of these things or would be willing to pick up some of these things? I definitely think you gave us some things that our providers can put into use. I think um, stretching between calls, I think that's a really great idea. I think that like packing a lunch so that they can be um, having proper nutrition between calls, things like that are something that we can definitely use to better ourselves and take care of ourselves. Yeah, I love that idea. You know, I don't, it kind of came to me later in life, but I, to really understand how food made me feel, mm -hmm. right? Not just how good food tasted different, but how it made me feel, right? Um, I don't know why. You know, I, I don't have a problem with the concept that I could take this crazy small pill and it could help me with a headache or, you know, whatever. But yet I eat massive amount of food. And of course, it's going to have an impact, right, on how I feel. So I knew that I had to really focus on food that made me feel better. When I think about that Snickers commercial, right? And I don't know if it's still on, but you've got, you know, two different versions of someone where they're angry and they're irritable and then they get a Snickers and they're, you know, just this passive happy person. And maybe the Snickers isn't the best choice, but it really does show that we can be irritable if we don't have some kind of food. And a lot of times the break itself, being able to take a break to eat, is more important um, than how much food necessarily that we have. You just having that moment. It's always a good idea to have good choices of food because food does make you feel bad. It can give you a food hangover. Um, but having the break to, to honor that time and get some separation is really critical. And I hear Lieutenant Wenzel talked about, yeah, taking the time to, 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 to prepare your food or to have your food available. Mm -hmm. right not be so not be so dependent upon the environment but to take care of ourselves right to pack our own lunch to have that available to have that snack and in you know when you have an opportunity to eat not shoving it in and i'm guilty of that you know it's like everything's got to be done under a ticking time bomb but it's i don't have to look at my phone when i'm eating I don't have to stand up while I'm eating. I don't have to walk around while I'm eating. I can sit down. It's not going to take that much time. And I can just be present for the food that I'm getting. So there are definitely some comments in the chat. So Ashley uh, sent out the link for your sign-in um, right. to get your CEUs. That LOSAP field, somebody asked, LOSAP is for Baltimore County Fire Department. If you're not in Baltimore County, I, I can't speak whether you have a LOSAP um very insightful meaningful information thank you so much thank you awesome information i believe i can because a lot of time my job really does get on my nerves a lot so the happy place idea is definitely a plus yeah galaxy s8 you're welcome to unmute and um share thoughts if anyone if you want to speak mm -hmm. up, please let us know and i'll add too if it's not going to work for you bring it up Maybe there's something else that's out there that can work for you because this is not one size fits all. Um, you know, I, I think that one thing that I have to remind myself of is I have to take care of myself first 
before I can take care of anyone else. And so that that section's as much for me as it is anyone else. But I know you guys are on the scene saving lives all the time. And so it's really easy to put yourself in the back burner. And so you got to figure out a way to honor yourselves and take care of yourselves. I love the idea. I've heard the saying that if you want to know what your priorities are, look at your checkbook and your calendar. Yep. Um, uh, SL says I can identify and go through all the emotions. I do. I binge watch movies on the weekend and take small walks to not think about work. Yeah. And it's a practice to turn it off because it does, because you care, it gets into, into those deep recesses. So you've got to figure out ways to turn it off in a healthy way. So if it's a walk, pay attention to the leaves, if there are leaves, um, pay attention to the animals in the area, pay attention to the way that the, the wind feels you know, against your skin, pay attention to the sounds around you. Because if you're focused on that, your brain's not going to have the energy to focus on what happened four days ago. Nicole Fight says, yes, a lot of times it's hard for us to admit we are not okay and we need to speak up. Lots of times we are so focused about helping others, like you said, we forget our most important person. Ari says, my supervisor, when asked how she is doing, often says, adequate. <laughs> <laughs> I think the idea, Isabella says, I think the idea of looking to your family, friends, coworkers, and what they might say about you and your behavior is a helpful tool in monitoring your own mental state. So true. And that's hard to hear sometimes, but these are the people that, that see you day in and day out. And if they're like, you, you kind of need to take a step back. You're having, you're having a day. There may be something to it. You know, they do see, they're, they've got your best interest in mind. So take a breath and then see how that fits. Jay Hickman says, it's so hard not to be in rush mode when you're on the clock. It is, it absolutely is. And nothing needs to necessarily take a huge amount of time. Sometimes it's just taking a breath before you, make the next move because if you think about the fact that if you're getting ready to respond to a call if you're getting ready to respond to an emergency when we're under stress we will have short breaths just like usain bolt but we'll also have a tendency to hold our breath mm -hmm. and so in an emergency situation when you're super stressed when you're ready to respond when you're under threat holding your breath is not really helpful because you're cutting off all the oxygen supply and you're decreasing your ability to be alert. So if you just pause for a moment and take a deep breath, you're actually replenishing your oxygen supply, which is going to help you be more alert, be more strategic in responding, and it's going to give you some space to be present and respond more fully. And it doesn't take any time. Just practice. I love that. It's more of a response, that practice enforces it. it's more of a response rather than a reaction. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Rob Gold says, when someone asks, how are you? I was challenged to emphatically say, excellent. At first it felt silly, but after a while I realized it's impossible to say it and not actually feel excellent. That's awesome. Try it. Uh, without being glib, Matthew Byers, without being glib, I think this will help me identify when others are under stress, family members included, and be more sympathetic to them. Yeah. Beautiful. And, that, you know, that's something where you can say, hey, let's go for a walk or, mm -hmm. you know, let's just go outside and look outside at the weather. You know, you don't have to do anything that takes a long period of time, but just getting a change of scenery. Before everyone jumps off, I just want to thank everybody. And I also want to say that as a supervisor in the department, there is no stigma. People want to help you. If you have problems, please come forward. They're not going to judge you. You're not going to lose your job. If you have a problem, please tell someone. Or we've got a great SISM team. Please use it. Thanks for that reminder. 
Uh, Jacob Hill said, suppose a provider has been impacted by the physical changes of the brain, such as decreased gray matter in the temporal parietal region, do coping methods help to reduce or reverse these physical changes? Yep, and I just put in the chat, you can always grow gray matter. So the biggest study that has been proven to increase gray matter, and this is, this is true across age because we lose gray matter as we age, but even individuals that are older in age that typically would be losing gray matter, we're able to retain it across time simply by meditating. And so meditation may not be your thing, but I'll tell you, there are a lot of ways to get into it. And that's just listening to it. You don't actually have to close your eyes. You don't have to sit still. Just listen to it and see what you think. The more you listen to it, and there are things like Headspace, which is now on Netflix. Um, there's Headspace, an app. There's Calm, which is an app. There's Aura, which is an app. You can go to meditation on YouTube all sorts of podcasts on meditation, listen to it and see how that works for you. It'll give you some ideas about how to get into it. If it's something that does work for you, that is a proven way to increase gray matter. And so when they were studying gray matter in monks who had meditated over decades, they found out that they had very little loss of gray matter. And they also found that people that started meditation, regardless of age, were able to increase their gray matter. So that is a great way to build gray matter. And be compassionate with yourself if you try to adopt meditation because it takes a little bit of time and practice. So be compassionate with yourself. Yeah. There was just a great book I heard uh, that was just published, I think, from Sanjay Gupta, who did uh, about neuroplasticity. I don't remember the title, but it was just yeah. yeah. But yeah, about the, that science about how the brain remodels and grows in ways that we really never quite understood that these new practices or taking on a new practice can actually create physical changes within our brain, which is pretty exciting. Uh, Ian Jones writes, officers need to be more aware and conscious of this idea being a positive advocate for the crews when seeking help and talking about incidences, incidents that we are involved in. We need to be the role model. I think absolutely be a role model, but also recognize that we all have off days, you know, and you can be a role model by acknowledging it's a tough day for me. I can't, I can't talk shop. I can't, um, I can't be my happy self. It's a tough day and that's okay. That's being a role model also. Yep. It's human for sure. Yeah. That's all we have in the chat. Anyone else? Make sure you have the sign in. We need to resolve all sign in concerns during this webinar. We're not going to be able to resolve these afterwards. Well, if there are no other comments, Stephanie, I just really, again, want to acknowledge you and thank you and honor you for sharing all the experience and great stories. And yeah, I think that you really touched some hearts and hopefully have, yeah, just helped to raise awareness. Thank you for helping to take care of us. Thank you and thank all of you for what you do. It is truly, I've, I'm grateful. I really am for all that you do for so many people. So be safe, take care. Thank you so much. Lieutenant Wenzel, thank you so much for bringing her to us. Thank you very much.